Здравствуйте, товарищи. Welcome back to Russian Through Propaganda. Today is day 20, and we're covering subordinate clauses. Uh, but first, let's start by reviewing question words. Most of these we've seen already in our examples. Let's just review these and practice pronouncing them. Uh, remember, a question word, what is a question word? Well, pretty simple. It can begin a question. Uh, so here are a few of the most common ones. Что? Кто? That's the nominative, right? So that's kind of uh, a who in the subject position, like who is that, right? Kavo, remember that's the accusative uh, or the genitive, right? But most important perhaps is the accusative of uh, who, right? Whom, for example, whom do you see? Где, когда, как, почему, какой, Okay, those final three question words are adjectival, right? We've seen most of those already. Kakoi, uh, kakaya, kakoya, meaning what kind of. Uh, then che, cha, chua, meaning whose. And then one I think we haven't seen, katori, katoria, katoria, which uh, kind of strictly speaking means which, like which of these items would you like to buy, that kind of idea. Uh, but we've already seen that a lot of times in spoken Russian, kakoi really can also mean which, right? So you might want to pencil that in um, in your book. Kakoi, uh, we should think of that generally as meaning what kind of, but sometimes it, it may simply mean which or what. Um, Okay, so anyway, more on katori in a moment, right? It's, it's has a, it has another use, not as a question word, but in forming subordinate clauses, it's going to form who or which clauses. So that's going to be probably the most common use of katori that we see. Um, so let's just look at a few examples of uh, using these question words. Что ты делаешь? Кто это? Кто это был? Okay, there's кто, right, acting as the subject. That's the nominative form of кто. Кого вы видите? Whom do you see? Now, to make sense of that, you might remember that кто, right, will always refer to a person, so it's always going to be animate, and that might help you remember why we're getting what looks like and really is a genitive uh, form on that word there, кого. Right, кого вы видите? От кого письмо? Okay, there's a genitive, uh, a truly genitive use of кто, right, after what. From whom is the letter? Remember that what requires the genitive after it. Где вы живете? Where do you live? Когда и как ты отдыхаешь? When and how do you relax? Почему ты не любишь читать? Какая у тебя комната? Okay, what kind of room do you have, right? We're usually asking for descriptive adjectives, right, in response to that question, right? What kind of room is it? Чё это окно? Whose window is that? Okay, so pretty simple uh, examples there. Of course, most questions can be, they can be very simple, so there's no, there's not really any special grammar involved there. Uh, if we look at a poster, что ты сделал для воздушного флота? What have you done for the Air Force? A float is like a fleet. Uh, it, it By itself, it generally means navy, right, or you know, a fleet of ships. Here, the Avazdushni float is literally an air fleet, right, or an air force. And note there the perfective. What have you done? What have you accomplished for the air force? Right, что ты сделал для воздушного флота? Okay, we could describe that, by the way, as a direct question, right? It's this guy who's pointing to us. It's as if he's directly asking this question, right? What have you done, right? Что ты сделал? Now, we could talk about this poster uh, and convert this direct question into an indirect question, uh, which is very simple grammatically. Uh, just like in English, we could say something like, he's asking, what have we done for the Air Force, right? Or... Even more exactly, he's asking, what have you done for the Air Force? Okay, in Russian, same idea. Он спрашивает. Он спрашивает. He is asking, что ты сделал для воздушного флота? Right, he's asking what you did, what you've done for the Air Force. So, uh, when we convert a direct question into an indirect question in Russian, the grammar doesn't change at all, right? We just introduce a main clause, like он спрашивает. He is asking. 
and then we put a comma, and then uh, we just simply repeat the actual direct question as a subordinate clause, right? Он спрашивает, что ты сделал для воздушного флота? Let's review agreement quickly, right, with the words, uh, question words, что и кто. This is a fairly important point we've mentioned already. Что, uh, well, it's asking what, right? It's asking about some thing. Uh, you can also notice that it ends in an or, right? So that might help us remember that что is always going to be uh, neuter singular, right? Neuter singular for agreement purposes. Uh, for example, что это было? Что это было? Right, no, the было, right? Uh, now, what about кто? Well, кто, we know it, it's going to refer to a person, right? Who? Um, but this one's a bit trickier, perhaps, right? Despite in, ending in о, uh, again, remember, it doesn't refer to a neuter thing. It refers to a person. And uh, кто, in fact, is always masculine singular for purposes of agreement. It doesn't matter if we're asking clearly about a woman or maybe about multiple people, like who was at the party last night, right? It's never going to be feminine. It's never going to be plural for agreement purposes. Um, so, for example, if we asked who was that, it would be кто это был? Кто это был? Um, okay, so again, that's one of these things students often ask about. You know, it may strike them as really peculiar at first, right? And it may seem kind of sexist or unfair uh, or simply inaccurate in some sense, right? Uh, but, you know, generally, it's probably wise not to get too worked up about the, these things because grammatical gender doesn't often, uh, for people who are used to it, it doesn't necessarily register as being parallel with biological gender in any meaningful sense. Of course, there it can, but not necessarily. And, you know, another example of that we've mentioned already is the word chilaviek, which is the Russian for human being, right? And so it, despite being grammatically masculine, that word chilaviek really does not at all imply that uh, you're speaking about a human being, uh, about a man, or if, that you're implying somehow that a female human being is less of a human being. Uh, that, that idea just never pops up. The word chilaviek, uh, despite its grammatical gender, clearly could mean any human being whatsoever. Right, so you could think of ktua sort of along those lines, right, uh, as, as invoking this idea of chilaviek. Uh, but again, for grammatical purposes, the, the important thing to remember is that it's always going to be masculine singular. And again, we see that in the verb in the simple question, кто это был, right? You would never ever say кто это была or кто это были, right? Always был. Okay, a couple of other examples with, with uh, кто. Кто читает Толстого? Who's reading Tolstoy? Okay, again, that could refer to maybe we're, we're asking about multiple people who are reading Tolstoy, right? doesn't matter. We still get кто читает, right? Not кто читает. Uh, finally, who wrote the article? Кто написал статью? Okay, again, написал, we see a, ma a, a masculine singular verb. Okay, let's uh, ask a few questions, starting with the adjectival uh, forms, какой, который, and че. Okay, we just need to remember that these three um, question words are adjectives, right? And we, we learned already that once an adjective, always an adjective, right? These words can only act as adjectives. That means they're going to uh, refer to a noun, modify a noun, and they're going to need to agree with that noun in terms of gender, right? So let's ask number one, what kind of book is that? Is it interesting or boring? Okay, kniga. So we need kakaya. Kakaya at the kniga. Okay, number two. Now, we've got to watch out for case as well now, right? We're juggling three cases already. We see blank книгу ты купил. Okay, what book did you buy? Okay, uh, let's analyze quickly the grammar. Ты is our subject. Купил is our verb. So, and книгу we see here is in the accusative. So, that's our direct object. So, we need an accusative form. Какую книгу? Какую книгу ты купил? Дорогую или дешевую? And again, look in the follow-up question, even though we're not repeating the word книгу, right, we're still talking about this direct object, and so we keep the accusative case here, as long as we're describing this book we've just mentioned uh, in the role of a direct object. Okay, number three, whose photograph is that? Pa uh, Pavel's or Tatiana's? 
Okay, photographia is being modified feminine, so we need chat photographia. Pavla ili Tatiany. Okay, what case are those two names then? Um, well, do you, do you happen to know the nominative form of these Russian names? First one is Pavel, right? And we see there we're getting a mobile vowel when we create the genitive, right? Pavel becomes Pavla. Pavla. Ili Tatiany. That's a female name from Tatiana, right? So that's the genitive of Tatiana. Okay, number four. Now, again, we, we're shifting the case here. Uh, remember, in Russian, we say to look at something, we say smatret na, followed by the accusative. So here we're asking, at whose photograph are you looking, right? Whose photograph are you looking at? Now, note the photographiu. There's a clue. We need accusative, right? Photographiu. So, uh, remember the old rule, a becomes u, ya becomes you. If we were starting out with cha photographia uh, in the accusative, that's now becoming na chiu photographiu vui smotritia. Okay, next, three, uh, next four items, we're just uh, paying attention to kto and sto, which as we know, uh, uh, decline, right? They have particular case forms. Uh, so let's practice a few of these. Okay, who is this or who is that? Kto eta? Kto eta? Who are you looking at? At whom are you looking? So here we need accusative. Na kovua vui smotritje. Number six, what did she receive? What has she received? A letter. Okay, uh, što, right? Što. Now remember, that's inanimate. So uh, što uh, is the nominative, nominative form of the question word and also the accusative, right? So here we're using it in the accusative. What did she receive? Uh, što. It remains što. Pismo. Right? Did she receive a letter? From whom? Okay, now remember, what requires the genitive? Genitive of kto is kavua, right? At kavua. At kavua na polichila pismo. From whom did she receive a letter? Number seven, for whom is this gift? Et et padarek. Okay, what case does dlia take? Genitive, remember, genitive. So, dlia kavua et padarek. For whom is this present? Um, blank, you will paluch it. Okay, let's think about this for a moment. Blank, it re will receive, right? Remember the um, pair for receiving, poluchait, poluchit, right? So this is a uh, perfective verb. Blank, it will receive. Okay, so we need a subject, right? Who will receive it? Who will receive the present? Kto yvo poluchit? And number eight, uh, blank asked you how they call you. Right, so someone asked you what your name is. Кто спросил тебя, как тебя зовут? Who asked you what your name is? Okay, here's a few questions you could practice answering. Что ты делал вчера вечером? Or, что ты делал вчера вечером? Right, what did you do yesterday? And note the aspect, as always, right? We're just asking about your activities. What were you up to yesterday, not what did you accomplish? Uh, number two, Kavua ti vidila včera, or Kavua ti vidil včera, whom did you see yesterday? Number three, uh, from whom did you receive an SMS yesterday? At Kavua ti polučil ili polučila SMS ku včera. Kakaju tibia komnata, a kakuju tibia computer. Okay, again, asking for some descriptive adjectives, uh, right? What kind of room do you have? What kind of computer do you have? Number five, как ты отдыхаешь? Ты смотришь телевизор или слушаешь музыку? How do you relax? Do you watch television or listen to music? And number six, когда ты работаешь? Утром или вечером? When do you work? In the morning or in the evening? Okay, uh, let's talk again about indirect questions. And again, this is thankfully very easy. There's really not, nothing new here, maybe except for punctuation. Uh, so keep in mind today, we're going to see a number of different, just very simple subordinate clauses. And uh, maybe the main thing to remember is those need to be set off pretty much always in Russian with a comma. Uh, right now, sometimes in English, it depends on the, the situation, we might not use a comma, although quite often we would. Right. So that's a whole another question, right? English punctuation. It's really not worth getting into uh, 
better just to talk about the Russian, right? Russian uh, subordinate clauses are almost always set off by a comma, especially in formal written Russian, right? So uh, that's a really important point to remember. Okay, so again, let's think of a direct question. It's a very simple one. Что он делает? What's he doing? Okay, that's a direct question in the sense that I'm asking it directly, right? Что он делает? What's he doing? Okay, now to make that an indirect question or a reported question, we simply introduce a, another, a new main clause, and we make the original question a subordinate clause, right? A reported or indirect question. So how can we say something like, I want to know what he's doing? Okay, again, see how we've changed the what is he doing from a direct question into a subordinate clause. And in Russian, we get, Я хочу знать, что он делает. Я хочу знать, что он делает. Note the comma. Um, now, here's one little point that can be a bit confusing. Uh, we've hinted at this at least once already. Um, what is this original question, the direct question? Что он делает? What tense is that in? Uh, present tense, right? I'm literally asking, what is he doing? Okay, now look what happens in English if we turn that... Uh, if we report that question in the past, right? If our main cl clause is in the past tense, for example, I asked, yes, Brazil, yes, Brazil, I asked what he was doing. Okay, look what hap what's happened in the English, right? Um, we shifted the tense of the question to match the tense of the um, main clause, right? It's become past tense as well. You may not even think about that as an English speaker, but it's something we do. I asked what he was doing. Okay, but if we think back, that really wasn't the original question, right? I didn't ask what was he doing, right? Uh, I asked what is he doing? That's literally, that was literally the direct question. Okay, so uh, in, in Russian, in some ways, it's a little bit more accurate, right? Uh, we maintain the tense of the original direct question, even if we turn it into a reported question. It doesn't matter what we do to the um, the new main clause, right? In this case, make it past tense. The original question remains the same. It remains present tense. Я спросил, что он делает. I asked what he is doing, literally. Okay, so that's something to follow. We'll see similar examples uh, with that kind of uh, tense issue uh, down the road. Okay, let's uh, try... Uh, just translating a few sentences with some very simple indirect qu questions, but let's watch tense, right? Let's keep in mind that black box issue of uh, not switching the tense the way we do in English. Okay, he's asking where I live now. Okay, let's get our main clause first. He's asking, on it, comma. Okay, we get a comma to set up our reported question. Okay, where I live now. Где я живу? Сейчас. Он спрашивает, где, где я живу сейчас. Okay, number two now. Here we're switching tense to the past, but remember the question, the original question is not going to change in Russian. It's not going to change tense. So он меня, он спросил, or if we keep the me, он меня спросил, где я живу сейчас. He asked me where I live now. Uh, okay. Uh, number three, he asked me where I used to live. Okay, now, so what did he actually ask me? Here, the original question was clearly past tense, right? Где я жил? Okay, so let's make the complete uh, statement, the complete sentence. Он меня спросил, где я жил? Okay, there again, the reported question isn't the past tense because that was the original question, right? The original question wasn't where do I live now, but rather where I used to live. So in that case, of course, then we, we do have past tense in the reported question. Number four, I don't know what they're doing today. Okay, let's get our main clause. I don't know. Я не знаю, comma, what they're doing today. Что они делают сегодня? Я не знаю, что они делают сегодня. Okay, number five, they don't understand why we don't watch television. Okay, let's get the main clause first. They don't understand. Они не понимают, comma. Now we're ready for our reported question. 
Why we don't watch television? Почему мы не смотрим телевизор? Они не понимают, почему мы не смотрим телевизор. Number six, we wanted to know what kind of room he has. Okay, let's get our main clause. We wanted to know. Мы хотели знать. Мы хотели знать, comma. Okay, now be careful to uh, nail the Russian idiom, right? What kind of room he has? Well, we might start thinking, okay, how are we going to translate he has? But we've got to remember the Russian idiom for possession is, is much different from the English. We want to say, what kind of room is at him? Right, so always keep your guard up for these Russian idioms. Мы хотели знать, какая у него комната. Какая у него комната. Okay, more um, conversational practice if you have a partner or just want to try to tell about a few of these things yourself. Uh, мой папа или моя мама всегда спрашивает blank, right? So you can fill in some reported questions. Or number two, мой друг или подруга хочет знать blank. Or number three, мой сосед или соседка не понимает, right? They don't understand blank, right? And we can fill in any of these reported questions. Что я делаю? Где я был? Или где я была? Когда я буду дома, right? When I'll be home. Почему я никогда не работаю? They want to know why I never work. They want to know какое у меня расписание, what kind of schedule I have. Or finally, they want to know как я живу. Как я живу, how I live, how I'm doing. We could translate it as how I'm doing. Okay, let's uh, now look at some other simple clauses, that clauses, right? That, uh, for example, in, in English, I know that, blank, 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 right? So uh, for that, in uh, Russian, we're going to use что, right? So the same question word we've seen already, but now used to create that clauses. And when we do that, uh, uh, namely, use что in the sense of that. The что is not stress. Uh, so that's maybe a seemingly subtle point, but it's an important one. I think if in, in time you'll just get used to this. Uh, but let's compare two examples, right? First, we have a direct question of the sort we were just making. Я знаю, что он читает. Now, note here that the, you know, the point of that reported question really is the что, right? So you can see why it's going to bear... Uh, stress, right? It's and emphasis, right? It's the it's the point of the question in the first place, right? So it stands to reason that it's going to be stressed. Yes, now Storm читает. I know what he's reading. Okay, but what if we use store to create a that clause, right? And um, as we would in English, uh, as we'd say, I know that he's reading. I know that he's reading. Okay, there the Russian что is not stressed, and we say я знаю, что он читает. Я знаю, что он читает. Okay, um, let's look at a few other examples. Um, я понимаю, что говорить по-русски очень трудно. I understand that it's very hard to speak Russian. Now, note that especially with these th that clauses in English, we, we typically don't use a comma there. Uh, right, but it, again, in Russian, we have a subordinate clause of almost any kind. We would should really use a comma, especially in written Russian. Я понимаю, что говорить по-русски очень трудно. I understand that. Blank, blank, blank. Okay, next uh, to the right. Я думаю, что Толстой хороший писатель. I think that Tolstoy is a good writer. Uh, okay, uh, I heard that we're going to have a new professor. Я слышала, что у нас будет новый профессор. Or finally, я вижу, что, я вижу, что ты сейчас работаешь. I see that you're working right now. Okay, so pretty simple in, in Russian. Again, no real um, uh, grammar difficulties here at all, right? Just use a comma to set off the clause. Begin your that clause in Russian with a что, with an unstressed что, and then just simply uh, right, report whatever it is you're, you're stating without any you know, radical um, changes to the grammar. Okay, uh, so let's answer a few questions. Again, you can practice stating your opinions here. Um, okay, ты думаешь, что русский интересный язык? Do you think that Russian is an interesting language? 
Number two, ты, дум, ты думаешь, что русская грамматика трудная? Uh, do you think that Russian grammar is difficult? Now, you could answer to that. Я знаю, что русская грамматика трудная. I know that it's difficult, right? It's not really a matter of opinion. Uh, Russian grammar is pretty difficult, let's be honest. Uh, okay, number three. Uh, ты думаешь, что трудно говорить по-русски? Uh, do you think it's hard to speak Russian? Uh, well, again, we can answer, я знаю, что трудно говорить по-русски. I know that it's hard to speak Russian. And it is hard to speak Russian. We'll talk about that uh, many times in the future, right? Even as we start learning the grammar quite quite well, right? And maybe we're able to read Russian quite well. Uh, you know, speaking it well is going to take quite a bit of practice, right? It is not an easy language to speak. What makes it so difficult? Well, we already have a good idea, right? Uh, these endings that are changing all the time, right? Uh, okay, number four. Как ты думаешь, Толстой хороший писатель или нет? Okay, a, a little Russian idiom here. How do you think? That's uh, what Russians typically think. We'd say, of course, in English, what do you think, right? Uh, but in Russian, как ты думаешь? How do you think? Толстой хороший писатель или нет? Is Tolstoy a good writer or not? Well, he's a pretty good writer. I mean, I think it's... Most people would consider Tolstoy a pretty good writer. But you're welcome to your own opinion, of course. Okay, number five. Как ты думаешь... Читать по-русски трудно или нет? Uh, how do you think? What do you think? Uh, is reading in Russian difficult or not? Now look how uh, in some of these examples we've seen we're using infinitives, right? Читать по-русски трудно или нет? To read in Russian is difficult or not? Right, so читать there is really our subject of that question, right? To read in Russian, is it difficult or not? Number six, как ты думаешь? Жить в России интересно или нет? What do you think? To live in Russia is interesting or not? Okay, uh, again, you can have any number of opinions about Russia, but I think uh, I usually tell students that uh, living or, you know, spending time in Russia is usually interesting at the very least, right? So it's, 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 I think it's a rare person who, uh, you know, speaks of having been bored in Russia. That just doesn't really seem to happen too often. It's definitely interesting, to say the least. Okay, anyway, moving right along. What about clauses uh, beginning with why and because? Okay, again, the grammar here is going to be pretty easy. We're just uh, practicing using these two words. Почему, which we've seen already. Почему, that's just why. And then the answer to that question, потому uh, что. Um, okay, so let's look at some examples. Почему ты не смотришь телевизор? Why don't you watch television? Okay, let's answer that with a because uh, response, a because clause. Я не смотрю телевизор, потому что я всегда работаю. I don't watch television because I'm always working. Okay, one uh, very common mistake. So again, you might want to circle this in your book and just avoid the pitfalls of first year and even second year Russian students, right? Uh, well, probably because of what we just said earlier that что clauses are set off by a comma. Uh, students will very often write a comma uh, in between the потому and the что. Okay, but if we're using that to mean because, you would never do that, right? So. Um, now, again, think of that uh, as, uh, right, another word that can begin a clause. Here we happen to have two words, потомушта, but we should think of that as a unit, right? Потомушта, потомушта, потомушта. That's beginning our clause, and so you wouldn't break up that, that little bit of the clause itself with a comma, right? The comma is always going to come before the start of the clause. So if you think of it that way, it might help a little bit, right? And look even at the English, I don't watch television, comma, because I'm always working. So here we have used a comma in the English. Uh, well, how do you say because in Russian? Потомушта, right? We don't break that up with a comma. We put the comma in front of the потомушта. Okay, so let's do an exercise, uh, just practicing some uh, because clauses. Um, number one, I don't have a car because I don't want to buy a car. Okay, now let's watch out for these non-existence or non-possession uh, constructions, right? Uh, there's no car would be нет машины, right? We need нет plus the uh, genitive, нет машины, 
у меня, right? У меня нет машины, потому что, right? Кама, потому что I don't want to buy a car. Я не хочу. Now, remember this little point we, we made earlier that after a negated verb, I don't want to do something. That to, that infinitive in Russian is probably going to be imperfective, right? Um, it's not that you want to, you don't want to accidentally go and successfully buy a car. You don't want to buy a car at all, right? Uh, again, more on that, on that idea in book three. But anyway, here we say, потому что я не хочу покупать машину. You have no intention of buying a car. Okay, number two, I don't have an umbrella. Zont. Okay, how do we say there's no umbrella? Нет занта. Нет занта. That's an in-stressed uh, masculine noun. У меня нет занта because I forgot it. Потому что я... Okay, what would the it be? We need the accusative of on, right, referring to zont. And that'll be его. У меня нет занта, потому что я его забыла. Right, note the, uh, the feminine, right? Я забыла. Забыть, past tense, we get забыл, and then feminine забыла. Uh, number three, I can't read this article because I don't have a Russian dictionary. Я не могу читать эту статью, потому что у меня нет. Okay, now we don't have a Ruski slavar, we need genitive. У меня нет русского словаря. Я не могу читать эту статью, потому что у меня нет русского словаря. Now again, number three, I can't read the article. Uh, imperfective would make a bit more sense there because you can't read it at all, right? The point isn't that you can't finish the article. You can't even start reading it because you need a dictionary, right? So я не могу читать эту статью. Number four, I couldn't do my assignment because I didn't have a pen. Uh, я не мог делать задание, потому что у меня не было... Okay, what, what's the gender of ручка? Ручки, ручки. Okay, here, uh, you know, we have a negated verb, я не мог, or я не могла, uh, but the emphasis here really is sort of on the accomplishment, right? I couldn't get my assignment done, I couldn't do my assignment. Uh, so here I'd probably go with сделать. Я не мог сделать задание. Although you could also say я не мог делать задание. Потому что у меня не было ручки. Number five. I'm asking and haven't watched the TV series because I don't have a television. Я не смотрел сериал, потому что у меня нет телевизора. У меня нет телевизора. Genitive. Uh, okay, there again, I'd probably go with imperfective because you, if you don't have a television, you haven't watched this uh, the TV series at all, presumably, right? Uh, so I would probably go with uh, imperfective there. Я не смотрел сериал. Okay, another quick conversational exercise you might try uh, alone or with a partner. Answer some почему questions. And of course, usually you'd answer those with a потому что, потому что clause. Почему ты не танцуешь? Okay, and you could say, я не танцую, потому что blank, right? Например, потому что я не хочу, because I don't want to. Почему ты не пишешь роман? Why aren't you writing a novel? Я не пишу роман, потому что я не могу, right? I'm not able to do it. Uh, now, remember, uh, these aren't the answers here aren't necessarily paired up with the particular question. They're just here for example. Right. Um, remember, не uh, If we're being kind of specific about it, that would imply a, a, a physical inability. Right. I'm not capable. I'm not able to write a novel. Um, so you know, in, in everyday Russian, you might hear that. Uh, but if, again, if we're kind of splitting here, it's umieć might be a bit better because the idea is that you don't know how to write a novel. You don't have that um, that knowledge, right? As opposed to kind of a physical ability. Uh, but again, those in everyday speech, I'm not sure people always draw that uh, careful a distinction, uh, but it is one to watch out for. Uh, well, let's take a, maybe a better example, uh, you know, a physical example. Uh, let's go back to почему ты не танцуешь? 
Well, if you said Padamushti and Yimagu, that would suggest that for whatever reason you're literally incapable, you're unable to dance at all, right? So there you'd probably say Yanyu Myeyu Tansivaj, right? Everyone can dance, but maybe you don't know how to do it very well, right? You haven't been taught how to do it. You don't have that um, knowledge. That would be Umyeyu. Okay, number three. Pachimuti niya siyish doma inyadikhaish. Why do you not sit at home and relax, right? Why aren't you doing these things? Right? I don't like it. I don't like to sit at home. And number four, why don't you work all the time? Right? There might be a good example with the physical inability, right? You're literally incapable of working all the time. Okay, we have one last type of clause to discuss today, a very basic uh, type of subordinate or relative clause in Russian, uh, namely uh, clauses that start with katori. Right, so these are going to correspond to who or which clauses in English. And these are also pretty simple, uh, but we have one uh, additional thing to worry about here, namely agreement, right? Uh, we know already that katori is an adjective, right? Katori, katore, katore, right? It's got the three forms for the various genders. And so as an adjective, it's going to need to agree with whatever noun it's referring to, right? So that's the one additional thing we have to worry about. Um, let's look at a quick poster and see an example. Okay, there is no such power, no such force. And here we have sila in the genitive of non-existence, right? There is no such power, no such power exists. Katoraya, okay, so uh, sila is a genitive noun, this katoraya, which is referring back to sila, to force, and so uh, we're getting the feminine form of katoraya, right? There is no such uh, power, katoraya prabaitila which might uh, enslave us, or which could possibly enslave us. By the way, the form of this verb, prabaitila bui, note the bui there. We're going to talk about that a lot more in book three. That, But for now, you might file this away. Bui is marking a hypothetical construction in Russian. That's what I call them. Most books call them something else, but I'm going to use the term hypothetical because they refer to something that's not factual, right? It's it's merely hypothetical, Um Right, and so you get the sense of that here, right? There, there is no such force which might hypothetically uh, enslave us, right? Uh, so to, to make these hypothetical forms in Russian, all you need is bui, that um, we call that our, our hypothetical particle, plus what looks like the past tense form of the verb, right? In this case, prabaitila. Okay, so uh, we're, we're going to uh, delay any further discussion of that until... Um, Book three, that's when we'll formally study it. We will see some examples of it when we read our uh, poetry at the end of book two, uh, but we're going to study that grammar later. But the good news is for now that those those um, forms are quite simple in Russian, uh, whereas they're usually quite difficult in, in other languages, right? Uh, usually this would mean having to learn a whole new set of verb forms, right, for your subjunctive or whatever you call it in the given language. In Russian, it's far simpler. So that's some good news uh, that we'll talk about more later. Okay, so let's look at more examples with katori and just worry about agreement, right? So watch the agreement arrows, right? This this who or which is referring back to a noun in the main clause, and it's got to match the uh, gender of that noun it's referring to. So let's look at some fairly simple examples here. Pisatil katori napisala tu statiu ruski. The writer who wrote, right? Okay, so pisatil is masculine, so we get katori. Okay, now let's get a feminine example. Я знаю студентку, которая уже читает Толстого. I know a student who is already reading Tolstoy. Okay, so look here. This is a little bit trickier already, right? In the main clause, studentka is in the accusative, right? But that doesn't affect... Uh, the grammar in the subordinate clause, the relative clause, right? We've got to treat treat the clauses separately. The only thing we're looking for is gender agreement, right? So if we're going to refer back to studentku in the accusative, uh, well, we're going to keep the 
feminine gender, right? We need something feminine to refer back to studienka, but the case we use in the clause is going to be dependent on the, the clause itself, right? What's going on within the clause itself. It has nothing to do anymore with studientku in the accusative there in the main clause. Okay, so it may help to bracket your subordinate clause and uh, analyze the grammar it, completely ignoring the main clause, right? Katore uje chitae talstova. Okay, what role is this who or which playing in in its own clause? Who is already reading Tolstoy? It's basically the subject. It's standing in for the subject, which is the student. Okay, so we get katore, feminine, but here we keep it in the nominative, right? Because the, the katore is the subject of the clause. Okay, let's get a bit, maybe a bit trickier. The writer whom we are reading right now is Russian. Pisatil. Okay, so to refer back to that, we're going to need katori, right? We're going to need a masculine form. But now we've got to think about case, right? So let's analyze uh, the, the, the subordinate clause itself. Muy suggest chitaim blank. We are now reading blank, right? This whom, right? The, namely the author. So you can see we need a direct object. We need the accusative case. Pisatil uh, is animate. Right, so our accusative is going to look like a genitive case form, right? We get katorova, katorova. Okay, that's a bit tricky. You might want to pause and, and look at that very carefully and see exactly what's going on there, right? Remember, we need agreement with the noun in terms of gender, but the case uh, only has to do with what's happening within the clause itself, right? What role is katori playing within its clause? Okay, let's look at, look at a feminine example. The book we are reading is very interesting. Kniga katoru muichitaim ochnintriasnaya. Okay, we're referring back to kniga, so we need a form of katoraya, right? We need a, a feminine form of katori for sure, katoraya. Okay, but what case do we need? Well, let's analyze. Muichitaim blank. We are reading blank. Okay, so it's clear we need a direct object. Accusative case, so katoraya becomes katoruyu. Okay, next item. Here's a genitive example. Uh, the author whose book, or we might think of it, the book of whom we are reading is Russian. Okay, watch the word order here in the Russian. This is a little bit tricky. After knigu katorova mui chitaim ruski. Okay, so uh, again, we're referring back to after. We're expressing possession. So we need the genitive form of katori, which is going to be katorova, right? After knigu katorova mui chitaim ruski. Now, I know a more formal version of that, if you're wondering, would be after chiu knigu mui chitaim ruski. You can't say that using che, right? But uh, whose? But that's, that sounds a little bit formal. You wouldn't often hear that in spoken Russian. Uh, okay, so we'll stick with the katori example. Okay, now finally, the case could be determined by a preposition, of course, right? Uh, we would just need whatever case uh, naturally follows the given preposition. My friend from whom I received a letter yesterday is a student. Mudruk at katorova, right? Remember, ot takes the genitive at katorova, right? We need we have the genitive form of katori because we're referring to druk. Мой друг от которого я вчера получил письмо студент. Okay, now note, look over all the Russian examples and you'll see we're using commas and we're using katori all the time, even though in English we sometimes drop the, the who or, or which or whatever, right? Um, for example, the book we are reading is very interesting, right? Uh, now we can't drop we can't do that in Russian. We can't drop the katoru. We can't say kniga mu chitaim ochinitriasnaya. That doesn't make any sense. Kniga katoru mu chitaim ochinitriasnaya. Okay, so let's fill in a few blanks of katori. And remember, our first step here is to pick a gender. Right? What noun are we referring to? What's it what's its gender? Then we've got to think about case based purely on what role the katori is playing within its own clause. Okay, so let's look at number one. The student blank here lives Russian. Okay, so it sounds like we want to say the student who lives here is Russian. 
Okay, student, that's masculine, so we're going to be using some form of katori. Now let's see what we need in the clause. Blank lives here. Okay, pretty clear we need a subject. So we're going to stick with katori, right? Nominative, because it's playing the role of the subject within its clause. Student katori здесь живет русский. Okay, the book which he is reading is Russian. Okay, he is reading which. So we need a direct object, right? Uh, he is reading blank. Okay, so we need the accusative form of katoraya, right? Because we're talking about a book. Okay, so what's the accusative of katoraya? Katoruyu. Kniga katoruyu on chitayet ruskaya. Number two, the Rus Russian student blank we know well speaks English. He speaks well in the English manner, so to speak. Okay, number two, sorry, yeah, so Ruski uh, student. Okay, we're going to need some form of katori, right, because we're talking about a masculine noun, student. It's also animate. Okay, let's look within the clause. Blank we's know, right? We's know, we, we, sorry, blank we know, we know blank, right? We, we need an accusative, a direct object. Okay, and it's an animate noun, so from katori, we're going to get katorova. Right, that accusative for the animate, uh, uh, right, referring to an animate noun is going to look like genitive. Ruski student, katorova, my znaem harasho gavarit poangliski. Number three, the sister from whom, right, from blank, I yesterday received a letter, writes that uh, everything is good with her. At her, all is good, literally. Okay, and by the way, here, Having read the example, we could say my sister, right? Uh, we Again, we assume that it's the speaker's own sister. She doesn't have to specify um, maya sistra, right? Now, remember, there's nothing wrong with that grammatically, but normally you would just assume that it's the speaker's own uh, relative they're talking about. Sistra at, okay, let's think about this. We need katoria. Feminine, but what case do we need after what? We need genitive. So, at katurai, ya vchera polchil pismo, pishit sto niyo fio hrasho. Number four, the question to which she answered. Remember in Russian we say, adjetit na vapros. We answer to a question, or maybe we could think of it as responding to a question. Vapros na katurai. Она ответила был очень трудный. Right, the question which she answered or to which she responded was very difficult. Number five, everyone says that the music blank we listen to, of course we add in English, is very strange, but I think that it's interesting. Все говорят, что музыка, okay, and we need who or which, um, Musica is feminine, so we're going to need some form of katoraya. Right now, let's analyze what case we need. Muy slushen blank. We listen to blank. We need an accusative, right? Katoruyu muy slushen. Ochen stranaya, a ya dumu što na interesnaya. Number six, ruski pisatil. Roman blank. Muy sichas chitayem da volna izvesni. The Russian writer, novel blank, we are, we are now reading. Okay, sounds like we need a genitive, right? That's the only thing that would really make sense here, right? The Russian writer, the novel of whom we are now reading, if we want to stick with the Russian word order. Okay, so pisatil is masculine. That's going to give us katori, right? So what would be the genitive form of katori? It would be katorova, raman katorova. Sorry, he's rather well-known, quite well-known. Number seven, the person, car blank I bought. Okay, again, the only thing that would make sense here is a genitive, right? The person whose car I bought, or the person, the car of whom I bought. Okay, человек, that's masculine, but again, as we mentioned earlier today, that this in no way implies a man. It could be a man or a woman, any human being. Okay, so maybe it's best to say here, the right, again, the person. Uh, okay, but we're going to be using a form of katori, right? Grammatically masculine. We need a genitive. 
человек, машину которого я купил. Сказал, что она старая и грязная, но хорошая. He said that it was, it meaning the car was old and dirty, but good. Number eight. Я думаю, что тот фильм, blank, мы вчера посмотрели, очень хороший. So I think that the film, blank, we yesterday watched, is very good. And how do you think? What do you think? Как ты думаешь? Okay, we're talking about film. It's masculine. Let's analyze the clause to see what case we need. Мы посмотрели blank. We watched blank. Sure looks like accusative. Uh, this is going to be an inanimate accusative. We're talking about a film. And so we get katuri, right? We just stick with katuri because the accusative for inanimates uh, looks just like the nominative. Okay, number nine. У той русской семьи, у блэнк я жил, была собака. Okay, this is a bit tricky, perhaps, because the we have this clause interrupting sort of our main statement. Uh, what's the subject of this? У той русской семьи была собака. What's the subject? Собака, right? So again, look at how the word order might deceive us, right? We have to wait all the way to the end of the uh, that main clause to get our subject. Dog was at that Russian family who blank I lived, with whom or literally at whom I lived. Right? Remember, who can describe being at a person's uh, home. Okay, what? Uh, so we're talking about a ruske simya. That's a feminine noun, right? Now note that here in the main clause, utoy ruske simi, that's in the genitive because it's uh, following u. Right, but we're going to need a we're going to need a feminine form in our subordinate clause. We're going to need a form of katorreya. Okay, uh, and again, we're going to need genitive after the u. Right, u takes genitive, so we're going to say u katorrey yajil. U toy ruski simi u katorrey yajil bila sabaka blank me immediately came to love. Okay, what are we missing here? Minya, note that's a accusative, right? Me, right? Uh, right, polubila, we have a feminine verb. Okay, so we have a verb, we have an object, but we need a subject, right? And of course, we're talking about the, the dog. The dog immediately fell in love with me. Uh, my host dog, I guess we could call it. Right, okay, sabaka is feminine. Uh, Again, we need a subject in our subordinate clause, so we're going to stick with которая. У них была собака, которая меня сразу полюбила. There was, they had a dog who fell in love with me immediately. Okay, number nine, number ten. Я забыл ту книгу, blank, ты хотел читать. I forgot that book. Or in English, we could simply say, I forgot the book, uh, blank, you wanted to read. Okay, let's analyze what case we need. We're going to need a feminine form, которая. Um, ты хотел читать blank. We need accusative, right? Которую. Я забыл ту книгу, которую ты хотел читать. Okay, let's have a little follow-up question, a follow-up statement. Uh, а у тебя есть зонт? Right, do you have the umbrella, blank, I forgot at your place. Again, у тебя can mean at your place. I forgot it at your place. Okay, so we need a an accusative, right? I forgot blank. We're talking about zont, which is an inanimate masculine. So we're going to stick with katori, right? Katori, uh, do you have the umbrella which I left or that I left at your place? Okay, that does it for chapter two. Um, We've made a lot of progress. You might want to take a few extra days to digest the stuff about verbs. Uh, I think, you know, case endings aren't easy either. Uh, but verbs are, you know, almost any language you study, the verbs are going to present the biggest difficulties, right? Because you have to learn how to conjugate them. You have to learn about tenses, right? And so even in a lot of languages that aren't as generally difficult as Russian is, right, the verbs would present maybe the most challenging item of vocabulary. Uh, now, with Russian, even more so, right? Remember, we're likely, we only have three tenses, so that part's really easy, but when you throw aspect into the mix, 
and things get a lot more complicated. Uh, now then on top of that, you know, using aspect means memorizing pairs, right? So you've got to spend a lot of time memorizing these aspectual pairs to really get comfortable using Russian verbs. Uh, so I would spend a lot of time drilling vocabulary. vocabulary. I think that's one of the really the secrets to learning Russian well over time is just having the discipline to drill vocabulary regularly and not imagine that that's going to be easy, right? You're not going to learn Russian vocab by osmosis. Um, the way you might, by the way, to some degree in other languages like German we mentioned, or maybe if you were studying Spanish, you'd probably know a lot of words already just from picking it up in the, in, you know, in, in your cultural milieu or whatever, right? Russian words are weird. You have a weird alphabet. Uh, you're going to have to spend a lot of time just learning vocabulary, especially learning verbs as aspectual pairs and, and drilling yourself, training yourself to conjugate them. Okay, so uh, we'll look forward to chapter three in which we'll introduce the uh, dated uh, case and we'll also learn more things about verbs, namely how the reflexive particle can be added to verbs to produce all sorts of new meanings. Uh, so anyway, until then, Das Vidanya Tavarishi.